Hi, and welcome to Seeing Everything All at Once. I'm Blaze, and this is the Chefbots team. I'm a PhD student studying at the Sheffield Robotics Lab at the University of Sheffield. Oh, oops, wait, sorry, that's the wrong image. Uh, hang on a second. There we go, that's better. Anyway, I'm studying insect eyes. Now, you may be wondering what's so good about insect eyes, and why would a robotics lab be studying them? Well, you see, a while back some smart people did a load of research and found out that insect eyes, despite being horrendously low resolution, were surprisingly good at helping the insects attached to them find their way back home. This is in part because of their ability to see in near 360 degrees at once. This is great for robots, because big, fancy, high-resolution cameras are expensive, heavy, and take a lot of processing time to deal with, which makes things like Raspberry Pis and other embedded computing systems very unhappy. So, bioroboticists spent a lot of time applying their insect eye knowledge to let them be able to use just regular old cameras and small mirrors instead. So, because apparently I'm a masochist who can't keep his work and social life separate, I decided, why not shove one onto our pie horse robot? <laughs> so, let's get into it, starting with the hardware. The general plan, then, is to put a camera on the robot facing upwards. Then we'll add a mirror so that it can see everywhere. The key thing to consider here is that now the robot is actually getting in the way of what the camera can see. The robot actually starts to block bits of the floor from its own field of view, causing this shadow to form. So to fix this, we have to make sure that the camera is actually raised up but we have to be careful to balance the height of the ball, or the spherical mirror, against the wobble that will be introduced by it being so high. Too high and the image will be all blurry because we'll be suspending the mirror on a big wobbly stick. Too low and all we'll see is the robot and none of the floor. So the approach I took to putting this together was to first model the camera in, this case, a PyCam 2, and the reflective sphere, in this case a 20mm ball bearing, in Fusion 360. Then I mapped out the minimum field of view of the camera, and ensured that the sphere was always within it. I found it useful to map the maximum deflection angle. In this case, we didn't need to see anything above the horizon line, so I mapped in a horizontal line, and tracked it down to the camera lens. That way, I could use Fusion 360's Constraint Solver to sanity check that everything I wanted to see was always within that field of view. From there, it was just a case of mapping whatever we needed to support the sphere in that position and the camera below it. After some work, we had a first prototype. At first, it looked all cool and sci-fi, like this. Later, it looked more practical and usable, like this. Although, I still think it looks pretty sci-fi and cool, because it kind of looks like that Slitheen space surfboard thing from that one episode of Doctor Who. Anyway, we made this change so that we could use metal to stop it wobbling, but in the end it actually didn't matter, so it ended up looking like this. And now, the software. Okay, so currently, the camera takes photos like this, right? That's the mirror, and in it you can see the room. But remember, we wanted to take the photos that looked like this. Now, to do this, we have to take this section of the image and unwrap it into something a little more like this. To do this, I designed and built a piece of software. It's entirely configurable to any configuration of spherical reflector and 360 degree viewing angle. It lets you load in a sample image, and then configure where on the image the horizon line is, using this reticule doohickey. Remember, because the image is going to be wrapped from that sphere there, the outer edge of that circle we're placing is actually going to be the horizon in our de-warped image, so the reticule edge there will become a horizontal line spanning the entire distance of the field of view. 
All the while, there's this little preview window that shows us what the de-warped image will look like. It's important to make sure everything that's supposed to be horizontal actually is horizontal. And then, finally, is the main settings window in the center. I can change information about the physical setup of the camera, like the distance between the camera and the sphere, or the size of the spherical mirror, as well as the field of view that we're targeting. Finally, just below it is a simple 2D rendering of the sampling rays that the software will generate that we can use to de-warp the incoming image. Speaking of which, here's what the software generates. In its purest form, it's a Python file that contains a simple mapping of pixels from the warped image to the unwarped one. For instance, if you wanted to find the color of a pixel here, you would take its x and y coordinates and then use them to find a set of coordinates in the lookup table, here. Then, you can use that coordinate to find the actual color of the pixel in the warped image. Once the color's been found, it can be used to render this pixel's color in the final de-warped image below. In this way, you can, pixel by pixel, build up a 360 degree rendering from the warped image. Now, you might also have noticed that not only is there a lookup table in the code generated, but also an array of angles, here. This array works much like the lookup table, only it returns the angle from the vertical that this row of the image is viewing. This means that when we want to work out a distance, say to this position here, all we need to do is look up the angle that it's projecting along. After doing this, working out the distance becomes a simple trigonometry problem. And with all that, we're able to take in a video like this and convert it to something a little more like this. Now this is great, but wait, there's a problem. Look at all those horrible little bits and flecks on the camera. They're in the way of the view. They're actually tiny scratches and bits of rust on our reflection ball bearing, being magnified up by the arrangement itself. But they're by no means the biggest offender here. Look at all that robot that's getting in the way with all its moving bits and dangling wires. They'll probably confuse all of our algorithms. But worry no more. We'll get rid of those. Going back to the de-warping software, we can click this Masks tab that's handily hidden up at the top. This will let us load in masks, like this one. A mask is an image that tells the program to change the lookup table to avoid drawing certain pixels. There are two types, and the one we're going to deploy to deal with our little rust problem maps all of the pixels within the mask to the closest pixel outside of the mask. See? Just like that, the scratches and rust nubs are hidden. Of course, this isn't amazing for large areas, because you end up with these horrible lines like this. Ugh. So instead, for our robot, we will deploy a lookup mask, which is a mask that points all of the pixels it covers to one single pixel. In this case, a dark one just here. And finally, just look at that view now. Not a sign of scratches or pesky robot in the way. This is what it looked like before, but now it's cleaner than a pair of hands that have been scrubbed for exactly 20 seconds. See? Before? After, before, after, before, after. <laughs> so, what exactly does all this get us then? For one, the most important thing this gets us is the ability to see in all directions at once. Instead of needing to spin and search for target objects, their relative angle and estimated distance can be ascertained simultaneously. Combined with our robot's mecanum wheels, we can just drive directly to an object with almost no sensor scanning or orientation time whatsoever. But I think we can push it a little further than simple object detection and relative positioning, don't you? One of the challenges of the Disaster Zone Pie Wars challenge was a toxic waste cleanup operation that involved navigating a veritable maze of randomly placed floor barrels and working out where each one should go. 
And now, equipped with our fancy new 360 degree panoramic camera system, we should be able to tackle this task with ease. Yes, my friends, it is time to enter the world of SLAM. SLAM stands for Simultaneous Localization and Mapping. But what does that mean, exactly? Well, simultaneous is just a fancy way of saying at the same time, and localization is the act of working out exactly where you are by looking at your surroundings, or by referring to a map. Whereas mapping is, as the name suggests, the act of making a map of your current surroundings to aid in your future navigation of the area. In SLAM, your task is to work out where you are and start making a map of it at the same time, so when you find yourself back where you've been, you know where you are. Simple. So, about that localization, eh? Generally speaking, localization, particularly of the visual variety, is the act of spotting landmarks and working out where they are relative to you, and as such, where you are relative to them. Now, in terms of the Pi Wars Eco Disaster Challenge, we should take a closer look at the environment to see what we might be able to use as a landmark. Looking at the map, there are really three things that stand out. The walls, the barrels, and the goals. Now, a good landmark is something that is unique. As soon as you see it, you know exactly where you are because it hasn't moved, and there's only one of them. For the latter reason, the walls don't serve as amazing landmarks, because there are four of them, and bar one, they're identical. In fact, they're so identical that you probably didn't notice that I just used the same image three times. The barrels, on the other hand, while not being unique individually, are unique in their configuration, although they can move about, so we'll leave them for now. The goals, however, are perfect. There's only one of each of them, and they are always in the same location, making them a prime landmark for localization. Looking at the panoramic images our camera would capture, you can clearly see the blue and yellow goals moving in the distance. Once that's fed through our image dewarper, we get a clear view of them as they move around on the horizon. Now, we can track the position of these two objects using an OpenCV color filter, and then use our lookup tables to find the angles and estimated distances to each goal. And, of course, because we know the position of each of these goals, as well as the distance to an angle to each of them, we can work out our robot's position by drawing lines on a map from each goal to where the robot should be, given that it can see them there. Finally, we can take the average of these two positions to find an approximate position of the robot. But let's take this one step further. Remember the barrels? The barrels we have to move about, and as such, we have to know where they are in the arena? The barrels that we said we didn't really want to use as a basis for slam because they might be knocked over? Well, we're going to use the barrels. The main difference between using the barrels and the goals as landmarks is that we don't know the configuration of the barrels before navigating them, so we can't do that sneaky line drawing trick, because we have nowhere to draw the lines from. In other words, we have no map of the arena. Instead, we're going to have to take a guess at what the map looks like based on what we can actually currently see and what we've seen before. That's right, we're finally on the mapping section of this description of SLAM. So, initially we assume nothing. Our robot is alone in a cold vacuum of nothingness. Then we bust out our trusty panoramic camera and scan for barrels. Remember, these will form the landmarks by which we will begin to build our map. Now that we've found some barrels, we can use their heading and estimated distance to mark them on our map. At this point, we're feeling moderately confident of at least a bit of our surroundings, so we can move around some. Once again, we crack out our camera and do a scan of our surroundings for barrels, mapping them in and... W wait, that doesn't look right. Some of those barrels are on top of each other. Of course, 
The problem is that the robots moved and we don't really know where. It could be here, or here, or even here. The only way to find out where the robot actually is, is to essentially try every position it could be, until you find a position that lines up with everything else that you know. At this point, you know where you are, and you can add the new barrels to the map. From there, it's just a case of rinse and repeat until you have a map of the entire area. At the implementation level, I actually achieved this at fast speeds by using OpenCV's filter functions. By marking the positions of the barrels on one large black and white bitmap, I could then form a filter, or convolution if you're hip, kernel, and convolve it over the map to generate a distribution of probable locations for the robot. Doing it this way had a few benefits. For one, it was much faster than doing it in raw Python, and for extra speed I could convolve over only the region around the robot. To match the rotational variances, I found I could actually pack sets of three differing rotations in each of the colour channels of the kernel, effectively allowing me to perform three localizations at once. Using a bitmap also let me blur the barrels that I detected, stretching them over larger areas at distances further from the robot, where inaccuracies from the pixel-wise detection make the estimate more unreliable. In the future, I'd also like to add custom-tuned probability fields that reflect the way the robot's wheel encoders think that it's driven to again increase the positional accuracy of the system. Looking forward, I would also like to improve the actual barrel detection system, as a colour filter is a rather archaic solution given today's advances in object recognition. But that's all for another time. For now, I'd like to say thanks for watching. You can find at least most of the code discussed at our team GitHub page, or on our PyWars blog at github.com forward slash chefbots and chefbots.github.io respectively. You can also see more of this sort of thing, as and when I post it, by following me on Twitter, at Blazing, that's with an E, or on my personal blog at blaze.tech. And finally, I'd like to say thank you to Rob and the Pi Wars team for putting this whole thing together. I know I've certainly enjoyed building both the robot and this presentation, and I look forward to seeing more spherical cameras out there in the competition course next year.